Dr. Gordon Walker, uh, Fascinated by Fungi. I'm here with the other Dr. Walker, uh, and we're going to talk about something a little bit different than I usually do, uh, because it's not going to be mushroom-related per se, but it is about research that my dad has done. Uh, and it's a really cool bit of science where they found a protein in plants uh, that manipulates bacterial behavior, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but essentially, this protein binds free heme, and that's the molecule uh, that has a, it's a complex iron molecule that binds oxygen, and it's used in all sorts of biological systems. You're probably most familiar with heme from red blood cells, hemoglobin, uh, and the way that we transport oxygen in our bodies. Uh, but we're going to dive in a little bit to what my dad has been working on for the past 30, 40 something 40. years, and, and a really cool discovery that he's made somewhat recently with one of his postdocs, um, and an awesome paper they just put out. Uh, which is some really, really cool science. So I'm going to dive into it and say, how long have you been at MIT as a scientist? This is, I'm just starting my 47th year. 40, 47 years doing one job. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's pretty incredible. I was 28 when I started, which is <laughs> a lot younger than people often are now. But I don't know how I... Quite did it. So <laughs> your, as far as I know, your career has been, for a lot of my youth, you were pretty much focused on DNA repair proteins and looking at mechanisms of bacterial DNA repair and how that related to higher level systems, potentially cancer, but also sort of like very mm -hmm. basic mechanistic stuff mm -hmm. of, you know, if you have DNA with a little kink in it, there's a protein that scans along, looks for the kink and then fixes it kind of thing. Um, and you formed the basis for a lot of what's called like SOS response uh, stuff, which is how yeah, <coughs> certainly how cells respond to DNA damage and fix it up and tolerate it. So. Right. So if you get a sunburn, your you know body goes through this whole system of having sustained some damage and then producing a bunch of proteins that scan your DNA, looking for little perturbations and trying to sort of x out the bad stuff and put back in good stuff, so you have solid DNA and you don't get cancer. Um, we would all have cancer if it wasn't for these DNA repair enzymes, right? It's uh, pretty incredible how much work they do that we don't think about or see you know, on a regular basis. If you get a sunburn or you burn your hand or you consume something that might be carcinogenic or toxic, we don't actually see anything from it because we have all these enzymes. Um, but alongside all that work that you did for the past 47 years, you did some pretty cool stuff with plants, which I think as a kid I sort of was like, ah, my dad works in alfalfa, I don't care. Um, but wh why should people care about alfalfa? Why should people care about legumes and beans and peas and you know all these all these plants that are you know maybe they're good for us to eat? But what's cool about them? Well, what's cool about them is that there's a kind of bacterium that I started to study sort of on the side um, that is able to undergo a symbiosis with these types of plants. The bacterium is called a rhizobium in general, and it in this symbiosis uh, the bacteria are able to persuade the plant to make little structures on their roots called nodules. nodules they look yeah. like little balls that are pink if you look at a pea or a clover or a bean in your garden. And the bacteria invade those plant structures, get right inside the plant cells in the middle, and then that provides them the environment to do this amazing trick. Uh, we're surrounded by nitrogen gas in mm -hmm. the atmosphere. But and N2 is what, 70 something percent of our 80, atmosphere? 80%. 80, 80, 80, 80 yeah, percent, yeah. But most organisms like us can't use it, but these rhizobia can. They know to, how to do this complicated chemistry, tricky chemistry of taking nitrogen gas, and they make it into ammonia or basically think of a fertilizer form of nitrogen, something that any organism can do. A, a bioavailable form, right? Bioavailable we, we form. We yeah. can breathe the gas all we want, but we can't make any protein from that nitrogen. But if you put it into ammonia, then it suddenly becomes something you can build proteins out of. That's that's right. And they um, this enables this class of plants called legumes to grow without any nitrogen fertilizers, so soybeans and beans and peas, all, um, alfalfa, mm -hmm. vetch, there's, and there are even trees in the tropics that can do the mm -hmm. le legume trees. So, and that, that's pretty cool, because something like 80 to 90% of plants have fungal partners, uh, whether it's arbuscular mycorrhizae or ectomycorrhizae. Uh, most plants are dependent on fungi kind of co-colonizing their roots to get uh, nitrogen and, and uptake of water and nutrients from the soil, except these legumes don't necessarily have that same sort of 
necessary symbiosis with fungi. Instead, they figured out how to manipulate bacteria into forming those little nodules and fixing that nitrogen for them. Well, there's a, there is an no? interesting... Okay. No, no, there's an interesting connection, though, because you've talked about mycorrhizal fungi a lot, mm -hmm. I know, on your, on your uh, Fascinated by Fungi uh, work. And uh, those fungi learn to make an association with plants about the time land plants first appeared, about 400 million years ago, roughly. Ev evolutionarily ancient and association. There is some hardwired stuff in legume plants that enables them to form a symbiosis as well with these particular rhizobia bacteria, and that evolved about 60 to 90 million years mm -hmm. ago, much more recently. Recently, yeah. But when so they had common ancestors that would have probably People started had to do it. Mycorrhizal. Turned out they yeah. sort of built that symbiosis on top of some of the basic mm. machinery. The platform for the forming exactly. symbiosis with fungi. So yeah, the basis of working with fungi then formed this basis for working bacteria. Exactly. Yeah. And that's I mean it, the thing that that blows my mind about this is that Rhizobium is a soil bacterium, mm -hmm. and on its own it does what it does in soil. Does it fix nitrogen on its own ever? It doesn't, no. It, doesn't. it only okay. does it in the context of the uh, plant. There are, the trick is the enzyme that does this sort of magic chemistry of taking nitrogen gas and make it into ammonia or what we call fixed nitrogen, mm -hmm. sort of you know, bioavailable nitrogen. The enzyme is incredibly sensitive to oxygen, so mm -hmm. you've got to keep oxygen away. But these rhizobia need oxygen, and this special environment inside the nodule allows the bacteria to have low oxygen, but be provided with everything it needs by else it needs by the plant. Hmm. There are nitrogen-fixing bacteria in the ocean, for example, mm. the cyanobacteria. Mm -hmm. Many of them can do this, and they have a bunch of ordinary cells, and they make a little special one that they block the oxygen off and put their machinery hmm. in there. So there are a couple other tricks in nature, but. Mm -hmm. The is one it, that's important for agriculture is this is this the biggest one. Is it a similar mechanistic pathway, or is it a different? The, it's the same enzyme, enzyme called okay. nitrogenase. Okay. It's just a different trick for providing right. the conditions. But it was probably like a uh, rather than you know cyanobacteria transferring that gene into rhizobium was probably like a coevolution. Yeah, somehow there was some. You know, this Something. nitrogenase evolved, and there seems, as far as I know, there's only. Only Any one way organism to really do that this. has that uses the okay. same enzyme, but some different tricks. And a big category is this legume. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what I think is super cool about this is that there's, this bacterium exists in soil, and there's plants. And at some point in evolutionary history, this plant figured out how to basically farm bacteria, or how to work in conjunction with this bacterium that was around. Does rhizobium, what role does it play in soils that are like pathogenic? Is it just sort of a soil bacteria that... It's part of the sort of what they call the rhizosphere. Mm -hmm. the, the, the root associated the, the, the soil associated microbiome. microorganisms that go around, sort of like our microbiome inside yeah. our gut, yeah. except it's in a plant, it's around the roots. And some of them have plant pr growth promoting things, but they're signature skill is this ability to make nitrogen gas and make mm. it available to plants so it doesn't need to have fertilizer. So how, I mean, how did you start studying rhizobium and plants in this association? And, and how, well, how long have we known about this association oh, it's, even? I mean, it's functionally been known for a long time, long time. but then some advances in bacterial genetics and techniques it happened just about when I was a postdoc in the early 70s, made it possible to study a variety of bacteria in the way that used to be only able to study a couple like E. coli, which is, I used E. coli as my model, the little common lab, <laughs> widely used bacterium uh, to study DNA repair and learn a lot about it. But I realized that these new t techniques, genetic and recombinant DNA techniques, meant you could now study other bacteria. Mm. And I thought this would be an interesting, the rhizobia, an interesting one, because maybe you'd learn something yeah. about this symbiosis, which was very poorly understood. And mm. so I just started to use these new techniques and made a bunch of discoveries as we went along. <laughs> you sort of took this basic 
science premise and wanted to say we we're going to poke at these little you know nodules in different ways and try to understand yeah. how the plants talk to bacteria how the bacteria talk to the plants what kinds of molecules and proteins are involved in that interaction exactly um, yeah. and you've been doing this for 30 plus years yeah so this is it's not a a, a new thing that you're studying it yeah and but, there were a bunch of other labs that started right. at about the same time. So it was exciting, you know, a number of the labs, you know, we were doing it at the same time and discovering different things. So I mean, share science. Previous to this, what do you think some of the biggest understandings in this mechanistic establishment of the symbiosis was, was it? Well, they, they knew the bacteria had to get from outside the cell to inside. Okay. The, first they knew the bacterium and the plant have a little con chemical conversation. Okay. That's how the plant knows the right bacteriums next door because uh, they ex exchange signals. And okay. So there's it, some receptors yeah. in the membranes right. that it, go back and it, forth. If and the bacteria, little chemical signals yeah. and one, if the bacterium realizes it gets a signal that says it's near its host plant, then it makes something a set of genes called nod genes that make a factor called the nod factor mm -hmm. that goes back to the plant and it essentially pushes a button on a hardwired developmental program for making the little nodule structures mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. the roots and so that's so that was a big discovery and you you can see this view of like sterile soil and you grow these these legumes you won't see nodule formation yeah. unless you have the presence of the bacteria right. if you add rhizobium then they start forming nodules yeah. otherwise it doesn't happen right so right. Mm -hmm. Sharon Long at Stanford and some other colleagues played big roles in sorting out this and uh, how how the nodule is made and then there's the issue of how they, they have to somehow get from outside this developing nodule inside and there's like a little tube of plant origin that kind of grows in and the bacteria come down hmm. the little tube and then they finally get in released inside the plant cell in the middle of the nodule sort of surrounded by a little bubble of membrane, mm -hmm. like a little soap bubble of membrane. So the plant is sort of compartmentalizing them. It's yeah. created a little apartment for yeah. them specific to these bacteria. Right. And then the trick is once they're in there, now they still kind of resemble a free-living bacterium and they have to turn into the sort of specialized machine mm. for taking nitrogen gas and making it into fertilizer. So it differentiates into a form called bacteroids. It becomes a kind of like a specialized form of that that's got this de dedicated purpose for its existence which hmm. is to carry out this process and are those bacteroids still reproducing like no well in there are a couple of variants in the way this evolved with different legumes in the one i study which is alfalfa and this little lab plant small little uh plant called metacogo juncatula in that case the bacteria actually stop Oh, dividing, stop. Okay. they keep making DNA, so they end up oh, making m multiple copies of their chromosomes, but all within one wow, thing, and I they get kind that. of bigger and sausage oh. So if it, if it was a eukaryote, have multiple nuclei, but these are bacteria, so there's no yeah. nuclei, it's just lots of the same genome yeah. doubled up. Does that in, uh, allow them to produce larger amounts of protein? Or? Yeah, I okay. think so, yeah. And they, I mean, this is where actually this intersects with this paper you're talking about, because a big discovery made by particularly Eva Condorosi and Peter Mergert in, in, in Paris was that these leg and others, but they were special leaders, um, that these types of plants had I expressed in, only in the nodules a series of little teeny proteins called peptides, mm -hmm. in sort of 25 to 70, 80 amino acids long protein building blocks long, and the purpose of these was to guide the bacteria from being a sort of free living bacterium, which is now inside a plant cell into this nitrogen fixing machine. Hmm. And that's how we came to study this one particular one, which was what appeared in this uh, paper. And I just chose it because there were 700 of them, <laughs> and I thought, let's focus on the cheapest one. The mm -hmm. smallest one is the cheapest mm -hmm. to make, it's 24. So, amino acids. So I mean, it's essentially, what you did is you took that that sort of bacterial condo, and you blitzed it up and isolated, or like looked at a mixture of seven hundred something proteins. Well, well they saw them. They found them in the genome. Okay. Initially. Oh, okay. Okay. And then so you, you screened the genome. Some of them made. Yeah, that gotcha. was the work done by the other okay. guys. I I yeah. just exploited that. I they were known, and this 
one particular one I also chose it because it had been looked at by some other groups and stuff was known about it and that you can sort of do these things on a broad way or you can kind of drill in. I decided mm -hmm. to drill in on this one mm -hmm. for practical reasons, but then it turned out unexpectedly it had this property that it bound him. Which yeah, so I mean, uh, you, sh you showed me a picture earlier of, of your postdoc, Siva, holding a little tube yeah. of red stuff. And normally if you isolate protein, uh, it comes out clear, milk. It, it doesn't come out with a whole lot of color. It's, color, it's colorless. Yeah, yeah it, it's kind of, it's it, you know, innocuous looking. And here's this tube of red stuff, which immediately hinted at a biological activity yeah. for this protein, right? Yeah. Well, sometimes, you know, you know, you're taught in school that you have a hypothesis and you do science and then you test it. But serendipitous things happen and a lot of my breakthroughs in my career have been noticing something mm -hmm. unexpected that was nothing to do with anything we were studying and saying, oh, that looks interesting, and start poking at it. And in this case, we had a totally different reason. We'd taken a, a protein that's widely used in the lab, it's easy to purify, it's sort of, and we just, at the DNA level, we just added this little sequence of this little 24 amino acid peptide to the end and mm. we were planning to do some spectroscopic experiments and put like, heavy isotopes in it for or isotopes in it for studying it by a technique called NMR it, nothing to do with what we actually <laughs> got so you're, but you're, when we purified the the thing mm. with this little colorless protein with this thing attached suddenly it was reddish it was red okay and, uh, so you were originally just going to look at like structure and binding and and stuff like that and instead you you kind of came across this hinting at the biological activity of what this protein might do yeah, which again I, is basic science leading to surprises that uh yeah, this that maybe can show this work down. was done by an i should say by an outstanding postdoc in my lab named siva sankari and she and her husband who works in another project and help their whole name? Uh, Vignesh, yeah, so Vig Vignesh, Vignesh and Siva, and Siva's the one who did the work to really like characterize the protein. Vignesh yeah. helped with the initial. Uh, yeah. That's the tube of the protein uh, with the protein, and you can see it's reddish. That was the clue that it was somehow binding. We didn't know whether it was iron or heme. It turned out to be heme, which is an iron-containing little flat molecule that Gordon already introduced you to. There's, there's a heme heme molecule right there for you just to give so you a kind sense of, a of what it looks like molecule yeah. with an iron in yeah. the middle iron thing. in the middle and that allows it to complex oxygen and, and bind oxygen in this reversible manner so you can carry oxygen around in the blood or in a biological system and bind or release it based on um, the kinetics of, of how much oxygen is, is present usually or, or other things you can adjust physiological the, conditions yeah, yeah you can I think mean, you can adjust the structure of heme slightly in a hemoglobin it's bound in this cooperative manner such that when you have less oxygen bound it wants to bind more and when there's more oxygen bound it kind of wants to unbind so that's how you're able to give and go oxygen uh, in your bloodstream as you're breathing and, and living um, but so what is this protein do because we f you found out it was red and it potentially binds heme but like yeah. how did you figure out the biological activity of this and what kinds of experiments did you guys do to kind of like pick this apart well it, ex it this insight explained an oddity we had there's a there are various techniques that used to be microarrays now it's a technique called RNA seq where you can perturb an organism in some way and then look at the messenger RNAs that made the the little intermediary species that encode proteins and you can see what ones are expressed and then you could change the conditions and see what what proteins are which mRNAs change and therefore what sh what's the change in the proteins that the cells are doing and we had carried out an experiment we put a low level of this peptide just in the free living rhizobia and we saw 15 percent of the genes in the organism changed their level of expression but Something that puzzled us was there were a whole set of genes whose function is to pull iron inside the mm. cell. They sit in the membrane and they transport mm -hmm. the transport iron tra in. Iron in. Okay. And um, Siva discovered that even if she added enough iron, it's they still turned on. Normally they would wouldn't do that anymore, but with a the peptide there, mm -hmm. they wouldn't. And what she figured out was somehow the the way the regulatory system is set up inside the bacterium 
it sort of monitors how much free heme there is. And if it isn't there, it thinks it's starving for iron, even if it's got enough. Mm. And that's, in essence, what happens inside the uh, nodule at the point when the bacteria are about to make this transition from bring free living into this nitrogen-fixing uh, machine. The plant exp expresses a subset of these 700, including this one. Mm -hmm. And, it and this is, these are proteins that are essentially keyed in to manipulate bacterial exactly, behavior, right? Yeah. So, and changing the sort of chemical environment around yeah. the bacteria to change the way that it's perceiving what's happening. Yeah. And this, so this peptide gets inside these bacteria and tricks it into thinking it's starving for iron. So it mm. pulls in all kinds of iron, even though. You know, in a there's, sense, there's it's got plenty enough. of iron. And yeah. the reason that's important is this nitrogenase, this enzyme that does the wonderful chemistry of nitrogen gas to ammonia, has somewhere between 24 and 34 irons per Whoa. enzyme. Well, that's a, a lot, lot, of lot of iron. A lot of so iron. So the cells need a lot of iron right. exactly at that moment. So the plant mm -hmm. knows that for the bacteria to do what it wants it to do, it needs a ton of iron, so it's evolved a protein to manipulate the way that the bacteria is, you know, forcing the bacteria to pull in lots of iron, you know, not necessarily for its own benefit, but for the plant's benefit, which again, I think is pretty insane that it's, you know, it's created <laughs> this little condo for bacteria, and now it's feeding bacteria in this very specific way that's kind of, you know, it's captured it and, and you know there there is there's got to be some evolutionary benefit to the bacteria to do this or do you think it's sort of plants are just masterminding the the manipulation here well you know i i, I know that, that's a that, tricky no, question no 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 <laughs> well i think there's i think it's it was a little tricky when i thought because people said well it terminally differentiated so even when the plant dies you know what's the benefit mm. but in fact the nodule has a lot of bacteria in it that are in these little tubes and things that haven't um uh, differentiated, differentiated. Okay. so so it's still so, getting a place for well, it to reproduce. When the plant dies, uh -huh. there was a George Truchet who was a French scientist who studied that. He used to say it was bacterial nirvana <laughs> because now you have this this root nodule, and the the only bacteria inside it are the rhizobia, so they can go and eat all the stuff inside mm. of this nodule. Then they release, and now you've got a lot of them in a the lot, soil. Okay. So it, I mean, I don't know for sure, but that's at least a plausible, yeah. hand wavy yeah. explanation I mean, for what's in it for yeah. the bacteria. And, and if we if we think you know big picture about you know no-till agriculture or planting cover crops, legumes are frequently used in farming to bring nitrogen back to soil, and that's because they're forming these little nodule things and, and probably releasing lots of rhizobium into the soil too, which then if yeah. you get more legume plants, you're going to increase the density yeah. of this bacterial population and the number of nodes, the amount of nitrogen you're fixing. So it's all sort of additive in some way. Yeah. If any of you have gardens and you grow beans or peas and things and you buy a little inoculum and a thing and shake it on, you're you're putting rhizobia on the that's, thing to promote. That's what you're doing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> exactly. Okay. So so it's a it's this small protein that binds heme. How how does it bind heme exactly? Because I remember you saying something sort of interesting about the the architecture of how this protein forms around this yeah. kind of like flat uh, flat molecule. Yeah. Flat I mean, protein. It's only 24 building blocks long, and we don't. So, so it's fully a small, it's know. a small peptide. Yeah. We did figure out one sort of principle. It binds at one nanomolar, which is sort of in the range of a, a reasonable drug kind mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. kind of binding. Mm -hmm. It's a tight right. binding. It's, it's, it's a high affinity yeah. association, yeah. so it you know yeah. it binds tightly. And because we originally discovered it joined to this big protein with the little thing sticking on it, we were able to see fairly readily early on that what happened is that two of these things, two so two of these balls with these peptides in the end bound one heme mm -hmm. and so you sort of make this dimer and then that changed into a hexamer by these dimers sort of turning into Flip six of them but with a new heme at those interfaces so in the end you end up with a hexamer with six peptides and six hemes, hemes. okay and it makes it biologically in, and it's, then it seems to go on into higher aggregates mm -hmm. so it, makes it biologically inaccessible, also makes it chemically inaccessible because it hides the ability of heme to, 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 to make up. things like yeah. reactive oxygen okay. species when it sees oxygen and stuff. So it um, does a good... So we sort of... That came out of this 
serendipitous finding. You right. had some extra insights that were hard to, harder to see with just a little peptide by itself. Yeah. So. But I mean, but that so that that's what got you guys thinking. You know, here we have this this cool mechanism, which you know, for any means is is interesting enough on its own to be looking at how plants manipulate bacterial behavior into this very relevant thing that we care about of fixing nitrogen. But you started looking at this protein, and SIVA in particular started thinking about what could you possibly do with something that binds heme. And, you know, you guys have thought about a lot yeah. of things, potentially. Uh, uh, I think they've fallen into two, and I say SIVA's got a lot of ongoing work right now. Mm -hmm. She's going to be on the job, applying uh, <laughs> for academic so anyone wants jobs to break, you know. this uh, this uh, fall, if anybody's interested. Fund some more research uh, on this yeah, kind of thing. Watch for uh, SIVA's applications. Um, so there are two sort of big categories. We realized that this, at some level, this uh, peptide had sort of drug-like properties. It was small enough to chemically synthesize. And in fact, heme is a flat molecule. The its own, its mirror image is exactly the same. And that actually meant you could make the mirror image of a peptide and it binds exactly mm. the same. It's made of D amino acids instead of what they call L amino acids. And everything we have is L. Yeah. And then yeah. non-biologically active things are often in the D form. So there's also, you can make a version of this peptide that's never seen in nature and it won't be degraded by the enzymes that degrade proteins because it's the mirror image and it's like a right hand trying to fit into a left hand glove. But anyway, so it had it potentially has some drug properties in a, for those of you who don't know discovery this early, you never know whether these things will work out, but that you get ideas and you try them and some of them work and that's how we get new drugs. But there were two major classes. One is there are quite a number of pathogens that require heme, but they don't synthesize themselves. It's like w the way we need vitamins. We mm -hmm. critically need them, but we don't make them, so mm -hmm. we have to get them from the environment. So the idea is if you have something that grabs onto the heme and ties it up, then they wouldn't be able to get mm -hmm. this essential nutrient, nutrient yeah. that they need to grow, and they will stop. And, and there's some so, sort of pathogenic type things, like the you said the bacteria causes gum disease. Yeah. Is potentially uh, dependent on gingivalis, for example, yeah, the free heme, free heme, or Haemophilus influenzae, which causes infections. There are a bunch of parasites mm -hmm. that uh, don't need it. There are even something like malaria, which Ma malaria is a complicated relationship. Oh, yeah, complicated, with but heme, it's still but at some yeah, point exactly. it needs heme is somewhere in its yeah. life cycle. And we're just hoping to talk to some people. Mm -hmm. A number of um, Worm, worms that okay. are helminths that are called to cause a lot of diseases that are big, big problems in different parts of the world and don't have really good cures. Um, a number of those can't make heme. And, so or, they're reliant on heme yeah. from a from Or a some even can make it, but they need extra heme to lay mm. eggs. Mm. And so, you know, it's whether this will work out, I don't know, but it's pretty interesting. That's one category. And the other category is there are a lot of human diseases and mm -hmm. conditions where uh, red cells Lice. break open. Something like sickle and cell and anemia. Sickle so cell get a lot is, of free a, heme is a perfect yeah. example. And the hemoglobin comes out and uh, the heme then pops out of the, um, out of the hemoglobin. And now you just have the little molecule by itself. Free and heme. It's yeah. a... Mr. Strong. Dr. De Jekyll, Mr. Hyde thing <laughs> that when heme is bound to a protein partner in hemoglobin, it's essential and you can't live without it. But if it ever gets out on its own, it's terrible. Mm. It's uh, incredibly inflammatory. It makes these things called reactive oxygen mm -hmm. species. It receives so oxygen. Free, free radicals. Yeah, and it know. gets into membranes and things and it's toxic. So the other category of response, and this is a more complicated thing, is it probably in most cases involve whether this thing could be used as a drug inside somebody, you might be able to get rid of some of these deleterious effects of free heme that right. are not only sickle cell, but there's a huge variety of conditions or um, even surgical procedures and things that... Re anything that causes stress in the body might and create... You know, create anything creates this high level of heme. Free heme. Even a bacterial infection, sepsis, mm. part of the problem 
is that you get free, free heme, heme, right? And that's one of the reasons you're you can die from lysis that, and, the, and lots of red blood cells exploding, yeah, so, releasing free heme, yeah, and then so, it increases yeah. the oxidative damage yeah. on your whole system. Yeah. Even something as simple as like drawing blood, right? Blood sitting in a in a blood bank is decomposing faster because the red blood cells start breaking down, yeah. releasing heme. Right. I mean, that's so you get some free heme accumulated. I've learned that there's some people that passionately believe that's important, and I've learned that it's some don't. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, this we don't. We're just at this point, just trying to find out if this peptide is bad for you on its own. You know, we don't know that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, is we're it, just yeah, doing if you, the if early you work on toxicology mice, would it, would it make the mice sick or pharmacological characteristics. Yeah. That's a, a more a, a, an issue we have to look into. Yeah. But so I mean, I, there's there's a lot of potential here, and compared to yeah. a lot of things you've worked on, it's easier to see applications for this yeah. one than some of the other. Well, things. it's remarkable. I mean, you <laughs> talked about the DNA repair. Thing earlier, and I made a lot of. I think our labs helped the world understand some of the mechanisms mm -hmm. of DNA repair, and you say how it protects us from cancer and things like that. There's one particular pathway I worked on for dealing with DNA damage, and if you block it, you can improve chemotherapy. And right. you could take my 40 years plus years of DNA repair, and it goes down to this one single application. Yeah. We have some a little molecule inhibits it, and maybe it could potentially help with chemotherapy, improve chemotherapy. This is the opposite. One discovery, and all of a sudden yeah, there's yeah. a whole zoo of potential opportunities. I've never really experienced anything like this in my it's, career. It's pretty cool. <laughs> um, is there anything else you want to say about the lab or people involved in this project? Or Well, you know? yeah, I think you know science is a very collaborative effort. Uh, you need brilliant young, excited scientists who can see things that some people would miss, such as Siva and Vignesh noticing, uh, Siva Sankar and Vignesh Babu noticing this reddish color. And then Siva was, was able to use techniques spanning from physical to chemical to cell biological to very, to genetic bacterial very talented yeah, all scientist. across the yeah. thing was able to yeah. put this Multidisciplinary. Whole, whole story and uh, another uh, Kevin Bion in my lab contributed as well and then we had collaborators with uh, the young faculty wonderful young faculty Sebastian Morito in my department who works on a um, parasite. Toxoplasmic Gandhi. Toxoplasmic Gandhi. 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 a quarter of the yeah. pop world's population. Oh, he's he's fascinating. Yeah, he yeah. was a great guy. Yeah, and we found the peptide would block its growth. Okay, that was, yeah, I think you remember you. So, Toxoplasmic Gandhi yeah. is uh, carried on by cats and yeah. apparently causes all sorts of uh, personality changes. And I, I may or may not have it. I don't know. I'd rather not know. <laughs> um, yeah, and another, Mike Yaffe, who's a, a wonderful, he's a trauma hemorrhage surgeon as well as an outstanding biochemist and he knew a lot about blood and heme and he helped us and uh, my colleague Kathy Drennan down the hall from me is a whiz at uh, st structural biology and she helped us with some of the stuff so again it's a and I, I'll, not an author on the paper but my collaborator on the DNA repair <laughs> chemotherapy thing Mike Heman has been incredible so this community of people and I've talked to lots of other people so it, it it's a paper from my lab and Siva should a lot of credit for leading this whole thing but we also engaged a lot of the scientific community as part of it so it's been really fun yeah that's I mean you know summary basically it's a, a protein that plants make to manipulate bacterial behavior and it potentially has really exciting applications and or just an amazing slew of things in which this protein could be relevant and whether it's used as a therapeutic or it's just used as a thing for assays in the lab yeah. or it's a ends up being used in material sciences or physics or you know who knows there's sort of limitless yeah. potential applications and ideas for this because heme is such a biologically important uh, and widespread molecule and just looking at the basic components of how you get proteins to interact um, it's pretty cool. And even the, the basis of, I think you told me, the, the history of this particular protein was as a defensin. So it was a, a plant's defense molecule that at some point stopped being, you know... At some point in evolution. Yeah, in evolution being, stopped yeah. being, you know, focused on killing bacteria or preventing infection and started having to actually manipulate bacterial behavior to orchestrate yeah. this very complex interaction. Yeah. Uh, maybe one other thing I'll mention, too, is I... 
this obviously wasn't anything I was funded for, and usually it takes years and years of work and papers before you can ever get federal funding, but MIT uh, has a program, the Amara Bose Fellows Program, which was a gift from Amara Bose, who was the MIT professor, but also the Bose speakers and stuff, started that company, and they asked sort of for a blue, sort of blue sky ideas, big ideas that would, you couldn't fund by traditional things, and they wanted the investigators to be excited and passionate about it, and if they did it, they'd learn stuff, and so I've got a, several of my MIT colleagues together, and we were uh, lucky enough to get some funding from that, and since then, a, a number of uh, collaborations with a number of other people as well. So I don't know whether it will um, go, but we'll be able to do a little of the early preliminary poking to see if any of these might be potentially. It, it, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't, but there's a bunch of irons in the fire, and I think that's what makes this project <laughs> so especially exciting, you know, whatever happens. So it's, it's not just one try and you're done. You know? That is pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I think we've reached the end of this, um, but this is Dr. Graham Walker, uh, Howard Hughes investigator, no, formerly pro professor, formerly professor, professor, sorry. Professor, American uh, Cancer Society, American Cancer Society, Society that's professor, that's professor, National yeah. Academy of Sciences, Sciences member, uh, anything else? No, uh, <laughs> American Chemical Society, all sorts of stuff. He's been, he's been at MIT for 47 years. Um, anyhow, thank you, Dad, for talking to me. Oh, thank you, Gordon. Uh, pleasure. I will tell you guys the name of this paper. There's a great, if you want to read sort of a quick news brief, uh, MIT put out a quick one. Uh, scientists identify a plant molecule that sops up iron-rich heme. So that's a great article you can read. I'll pop the uh, link for this down in the comments. Uh, the paper was published on August 11th, uh, probably pre-print, but in digital format, in Nature, Nature Microbiology. Uh, a heme-sequestering plant peptide promotes iron uptake in symbiotic bacteria. Um, Siva Sankari is the first author and a whole bunch of other great authors who contributed um, out of the Walker Lab at MIT. So if you guys want to learn more, check out the, uh, the links in the comments. And uh, thank you for joining us and listening along. So bye-bye. <laughs>